welcome to our book reading. We have a new book. It is called The Reluctant Dragon. Very excited to read this with you. It was written by a man named Kenneth Graham in Scotland in, uh, we think, 1898. It was first published as part of a collection of stories and, and then later on, on its own, because it was one of the favorite stories in the book. And I'm happy to bring it to you. And let's get started. Let me scoot up my chair a little bit. Okay. The Reluctant Dragon by Kenneth Graham. Long ago, might have been hundreds of years ago, in a cottage halfway between an English village and the shoulder of the downs, a shepherd lived with his wife and their little son. Now the shepherd spent his days, and at certain times of the year his nights too, upon the wide ocean bosom of the downs with only the sun and the stars and the sheep for company and the friendly chattering world of men and women far out of sight and hearing. But his little son, when he wasn't helping his father, and often when he was as well, spent much of his time buried in big volumes that he borrowed from the affable gentry and interested persons of the country round him. And his parents were very fond of him, and rather proud of him, too, though they didn't let on in his hearing. So he was left to go his own way and read as much as he liked. And instead of frequently getting a cuff on the side of the head, as might very well have happened to him, he was treated more or less as an equal by his parents who sensibly thought it a very fair division of labor that they should supply the practical knowledge and he, the book learning. They knew that book learning often came in useful at a pinch in spite of what their neighbors said. What the boy chiefly dabbled in was natural history and fairy tales and he just took them as they came, in a sandwichy sort of way, without making any distinctions. And really, his course of reading strikes one as rather sensible. One evening, the shepherd, who for some nights past had been disturbed and preoccupied and off his usual mental balance, came home all of a tremble and, bursting into the room where his wife and son were peacefully employed, she with her seam, he in following out the adventures of the giant with no heart in his body, exclaimed with much agitation, It's all up with me, Maria. Nevermore can I go up on them their downs, was it ever so. Now, don't you say calm like that, said his wife, who was a very sensible woman. But tell us all about it first, whatever it has, whatever it is as has given you this shake up, and then me and you and the sun here between us, we ought to be able to get to the bottom of it. Oh, it began some nights ago, said the shepherd. You know that cave up there? I never liked it somehow, and the sheep never liked it neither. And when sheep don't like a thing, there is generally some reason for it. Well, for some time past, there has been faint noises coming from that cave. Noises like heavy sighings with grunts mixed up in them 
and sometimes a snoring far away down. Real snoring, yet somehow not honest snoring like you and me and I, it's, you know. I know, remarked the boy quietly. Of course, I was terrible frightened, the shepherd went on. Yet somehow, I couldn't keep away. So this very evening, before I come down, I took a cast round by the cave quietly. And there, oh Lord, I saw him at last, as plain as I see you. Saw who? said the wife, beginning to share her husband's nervous terror. Why, him, I'm telling you, said the shepherd. He was sticking halfway out of the cave and seemed to be enjoying of the cool evening in a poetical sort of way. He was as big as four cart horses and all covered with shiny scales deep blue scales at the top of him, shading off to a tender sort of green below. As he breathed, there was that sort of flicker over his nostrils that you see over our chalk roads on a baking, windless day in summer. He had his chin on his paws, and I should say he was meditating about things. Oh, yes, a peaceable sort of beast enough, and not ramping or carrying on or doing anything but what was quite right and proper. I admit all that. And yet, what am I to do? Scales, you know, and claws, and a tail for certain, though I didn't see that end of him. I ain't used to him, and I don't hold with them, and that's a fact. The boy, who had apparently been absorbed in his book during his father's recital, now closed the volume, yawned, clasped his hands behind his head, and said sleepily, It's all right, father, don't you worry. It's only a dragon. And that is where we'll end for tonight.